This is a conference for public administrators, uh, by and large. Uh, what do you think the practice of being a public administrator looks like in, uh, in 10 or 15 years' time? Um, I, I think that the key is very simple, and really it, it's, it's echoing the essence of, of, of Mary's presentation, which is that the role of public administrators is not going to be to get things done. It's going to be to build platforms that enable other people to do things. And those other people could be corporations, or they could be individual citizens. They could be pursuing purposes that the administrators have anticipated and intend, or for that matter, they could be purposes that the administrators have not even anticipated, rather like the story of uh, reconfiguring the bus routes. The key becomes, therefore, focusing on the enabling scale-sensitive activities on the basis of which the citizens themselves can not only be productive, but can be empowered. Yeah, great. Oh, is that on? Great question. Um, where do you start? Um, every every area of policy, without without exception, has to be seen through through this lens. And so it means that there is a, um, if you like, a new um, a new a new type of leadership actually that's required. So when we think about infrastructure and roads and whatever, um, they have to be smart. You know, if data isn't embedded in every aspect of the policy and the, and the, and the delivery, uh, it absolutely has to. There needs to be new rules of governance uh, about, about this. Um, the architecture of um, what we've been speaking about, the architecture of, uh, I call it a strategic capability architecture or platform, uh, has, has to be part of the governance framework. And so, um, and so I, think, I think there is um, a level of urgency around um, the people that we, we, we bring into the public sector to, um, um, to, to, have, to have this ongoing, um, if you like, uh, more, than, more, more, than, more than development, but um, um, in, in, in order to make sure that policies are really fit for the future. And, um, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the biggest challenges. When we talk, talk about things that will go for 10 years, um, um, we need to do some pretty serious um, uh, scenario analysis around that, and, and I like the idea of um, DARPA, the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency in the US, and how they do things. And I think we're going to have to, rather than having silo, pro, silo develop pro, uh, policy, have have these intensive DARPA type of uh, task forces, um, which um, you know bring the best not only from the public sector, from all sorts of uh, areas, to really break through some of these things. So I think it'll be fundamentally different different models. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I think there's one down the back from Tom. From someone else who's not Tom. Hi, I'm Zoe Baker, Department of Health and Human Services here in Victoria. Um, Philip, you... Uh, talked very briefly about anonymization, and Marie, you said that you think there's no such thing as privacy anymore, or privacy's dead, I can't remember your words. Um, how do we, in, in the clearly very um, exciting new world of big data, where there are many hugely beneficial um, uh, innovations and, and exciting things to come, how do we understand what that means for privacy, how do we protect people's privacy, or if privacy is indeed dead or dying, how do we protect people from the potential um, ills of uh, so much of their information being available to so mm. many individuals and organisations, government and private, in this new world? Go for it. There are basically, I think, five answers to that question, and no consensus whatsoever about their relative merits. The traditional answer has been that personal information is a contract between the data subject and the data user, and you sign something or you tick a box on a website, 
thereby giving information legally, or the right to use information legally, to the data user. And for all sorts of obvious reasons, we recognize that that is profoundly broken. Not the least of which being that almost every interesting application of big data is not anticipated before the fact. So you'd have to go back and rewrite the contract every time you wanted to do something new. Five possible answers. There's a Scott McNeely answer, which is privacy is dead, get used to it. Right? We're just living in a different kind of world. Privacy is this ridiculous 19th century idea. We should just stop worrying about it. And there are a lot of people, particularly in Silicon Valley, who genuinely believe that that is the correct view. It's a quaint, silly, obsolete idea. The second view is the continental European view. The idea that what we need to do is we need to reaffirm this contractual principle by making it opt-in rather than opt-out, by making the contract sufficiently simple that people actually understand what it is that they're agreeing to, and by really, uh, really enforcing uh, uh, controls to make sure that corporations uh, abide by them. The problem with that is that the vast bulk of the internet economy depends on the use of personal data. That's what makes the internet economy tick, and therefore a large fraction of the internet economy would collapse if those rules were enforced. The third approach is the American approach, which is the FTC gets everybody together around a table, and we're all going to agree on a set of rules which the FTC will then enforce. They, the reason for taking that approach is that with the political logjam in the United States, there is no possibility of passing any legislation. Not a single such industry-wide agreement has actually happened. The fourth answer is another Silicon Valley answer, which is DRM. You basically give the data subject digital rights management technology to control how the data gets used. Basically, it's encrypted in such a way that only the data subject can decrypt it. And therefore, even if the data is passed on to some third, fourth, or fifth party, it's useless unless the explicit agreement of the data subject is obtained. The problem with that is it doesn't scale. It, you can't do that on a very, very large, uh, on, on very, very large data sets uh, without the whole system simply collapsing. The fifth answer may actually be the most interesting one. The fifth answer is the idea that you move the focus of privacy away from the model of a contract where I agree to give you the right to use my data for certain purposes towards a question of tort liability. If I am harmed by what you do with my data, I have a lawsuit or somebody has a lawsuit against you. And therefore you, the data user, are now legally liable not for conforming to a contract, but for the consequences of how the data is actually used after the fact. And that idea, the so-called harms framework, of focusing on the consequences rather than focusing on the contract, is one way that we can may be able to reconcile the need for flexibility, which is fundamental to the use of these data in all of these fantastic new ways, on the one hand, versus the need to preserve the rights of the individual on the other. Oh, well, I mean, um, um, for me, the issue is um, uh, what's the question with, uh, you know, with privacy? And I think it comes back to exactly what, what Philip was talking about. And, um, and it may very well be um, where people are in terms of their life's journey. And some of the people here would, would know this story. So my daughter had a baby last year and um, um, she and her husband, well, her husband actually is a real geek, so when, at 12 weeks of gestation, right, this little, or whenever the first scan is, um, uh, up, on, up on the web, you know, here it is, it's got its funny face, blah, 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 you know, and it's ex all the scans were basic. This kid existed digitally before it was born, all right? No choice, all right? And then, um, then, and I'm sure my, my, my daughter and husband are very nice people, so that was okay. Um, so then they said um, to their friends, um, um, so when the baby's born, send, oh, the kid, the kid had an email address before it was born, and send, and send welcome to the world messages to this email address. Um, and then what happened, baby was born into this cold world of harsh reality called not digital, and was issued with a, uh, um, my daughter was issued with a uh, blue book, which is like a car service manual. Um, which has to last for 18 years and uh, has carbon paper in it, so big she had to get another bag. So, so I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is that um, um, we have to insert ourselves into uh, uh, 
the situation to understand that um, and when, when my grandson is 18, um, I can't even imagine what his view of privacy will be, okay? Uh, because it's, what is the question? Um, and I think that's, we just gotta keep, we just gotta keep asking that, but not situating ourselves in what our own paradigm is. Other questions? Tom? I think that is Tom down the back. Oh, I can start working. Oh, thank you, Ben, and uh, thank you for the presentations. They're both brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, the question's probably all three of you, I think. I think in the whole room, you, everyone can instinctively feel, wow, this is such an innovative space and the gains look fantastic and already you're seeing extraordinary examples of it. And then to perhaps pick up Philip's point that if we start really thinking about this as a, uh, if you like, a platform proposition and a stack where government... I think if I understood where Philip was going, essentially plays at the bottom of the stack, essentially sets the, the infrastructure up so that something like, say, the Bureau of Meteorology or the ABS, the Bureau of Stats, says, look, we, our job really is just to provide the data, to use Philip's point, data's an infrastructure, and we let a whole lot of providers go out there and run their applications off the top of that, right? And I think it's probably exactly where uh, Marie was going as well, but Marie pointed out the really obvious point of, you know, very siloed hierarchies. If I think about it, you know, the, the entire statutory regime we all work in is very driven around those propositions. That's where budgeting comes from as well and appropriations. So our entire system is almost, you know, designed for the, the dark ages, if you like, if this is the light where Renaissance is going. So the question is, what's going to drive it into that sort of world? Because I can't see any market forces or anything that's going to really make a, a huge behavioural shift. Is this just going to be a whole set of breakouts? You know, various, if David Bartlett was up there from our previous presentation, you know, as a Premier of, of Tasmania, he could stood up, stand up and evangelise and make those changes, probably, a place like Tasmania. But how do you do it at such a bigger governmental wide? What's going to drive that change? What's going to push this entire room to go, yep, that's where we want to go and make that happen? I think I got it. Um, essentially, this is a discontinuity. And because it's a discontinuity, it, we're not going to get there just because of the usual incremental market forces, price signals, people see there's more money doing it this way than that way, and so the economy adjusts. That works very well for incremental adaptations in a context particularly of diminishing returns. But one of the fundamental facts about this new world is you, in fact, have colossally increasing returns. You have huge economies of scale in physical operations. You have even more powerful economies of scale in network effects. Facebook, almost overnight, having 1.3 billion members around the world. I mean, literally within uh, a handful of years. And when you have those colossal, rapidly increasing uh, uh, returns, then price signals don't result in the sort of rational reallocation of resources. Instead, what happens is you get disruption, you get collapse. Maybe nothing happens because you can't jump scale to you can't you can't jump to scale the way that you actually need to. But the system becomes rigid, and it, it jumps from one state to another state. It doesn't smoothly adjust. What that means in the private sector is that you have to do this thing that we call strategy. You've got to think in a non-linear way. You've got to put resources together in order to get to critical mass with respect to whatever is the new way of doing things. And that could be a new mode of behavior, a new mode of organization, a new set of skills, just as much as it could be a new set of institutions or physical assets. I have to believe that in the public sector, the issue is exactly the same. That the usual approach of small and incremental shifts following success and cutting off failure will not, in fact, get you from here to there. It requires a much more strategic approach. Yeah, great question. And, um, um, I mean, it's easy to say political leadership, but, like, you know, we've actually got to stop admiring the problem and getting on and actually changing things. And I think as public administrators, we've got a lot more, um, if you like, power to do things um, um, collectively. Okay, so, um, so an example would be, um, through, through this, um, some of the governance rules have to change, and this can be, this can be easily policy. So that um, uh, things like when, when um, business cases come up, 
They're not actually seen through the lens of a particular agency, but are seen across government in terms of a capability to be, be delivered. Um, and an example um, that I was involved in was the Basics Card. Now that's a, that's a payment platform. It was actually funded through a policy vertical, um, uh, through Faxia at the time, called uh, Income Management. And um, we knew that it would have far wider application to other policy dimensions. Um, um, but uh, the initial birth of it, um, if you like, was limited because it had to be taken forward in terms of that policy. So, so, so I think there are some rules of the game um, that need to be reconsidered. Um, I'd be very surprised if uh, any at the political level wouldn't actually buy into that because what, what, what the politicians after is uh, right, outcomes, okay? Um, and that's been sort of then distorted into, into some silo processes. So I think there needs to be, if you like, a, um, a rethinking of, when I talk about the machinery of government, these are the things that I'm talking about, the processes that in fact can be agreed to and changed to uh, across government. Otherwise, what happens is uh, what the situation we've currently got is um, just um, you know, the budget out of control, um, administrative processes um, out of control, all that, all that red tape. So I think there is a galvanising period that we're in now for, for this to change. If I could also add, though, that in times of disaster, we need to understand the, the permission environment that, it, that occurs when there's a disaster, when agencies come together across the three levels of government in Australia and elsewhere, because rules aren't broken in those situations, but heck, things move a lot quicker and there's a lot of innovations that happen. So I would also, you know, encourage people to look at uh, what happens in those sort of environments. Thanks, Marie. We, we probably have time for one more question. In which case, I'm going to ask one more question. Oh, we've got one down the back, I think. Hello, Ben. This is actually a question for you, because you're probably one of the few people in the room that's worked at all three levels of, of government in Australia. Um, so I'd just like your reflection on where you think, that, is it intrinsically at the Commonwealth level, where there's more, probably more resource, at the state level, where there's um, more access to some of the services that generate some of the big data, or at the local government level, where you've got a very geographic area of focus? What's going to be, is there intrinsically a level of government that's got the greatest potential to make this, to get better use out of big data, do you think? Uh, <laughs> that's a strange thing. I think I'm being asked a question. I, why don't I give an answer and then Marie and Philip can tell me how I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> my honest view is that what really matters is scale. Uh, scale at the bottom half of the stack in Philip's language. And we haven't yet worked out in Australia how to get scale in a systematic way that delivers public value. Uh, and there are opportunities to do that at the Commonwealth level, and in fact, probably the natural home of it is in the big Commonwealth service delivery uh, agencies like Human Services, where I came from, or the tax office, or some morphed combination of the two, which is effectively what's beginning to emerge uh, in the Commonwealth level. Uh, but frankly, there are ways that states can collaborate to create that scale in the platform, uh, there are ways that local governments can collaborate to create scale in the platform and frankly there is zero conversation about that and it's a massive issue for, for us and it's something that I, I really see coming into, uh, into local government. So there's scale in the platform, however you get that, and then the question is what kind of innovation ecosystem do you create at the, on the top half of the, of the stack? Uh, and again, how do you work with customers and uh, citizens and communities to, uh, to create that environment? Which bits of that does government need to control? Uh, and I think that's far more differentiated and I think all three levels of Commonwealth State and local will need to play a, a role in that. Uh, that's my view, but Philip, Marie? Great, great question, and I often think that uh, local level of government um, is, is overlooked in many of these strategies. I had a lot to do with local government when I was uh, uh, operating the business entry point. So, I mean, as you know, local government is an administrative arm of, of, of the state government, um, and uh, the processes are just replicated. So, 70% of the interaction between business and government happens at the local level. 
And so I think there is a, a great opportunity for uh, looking at these common patterns um, across, across local government and, um, and having, if you like, a different view of how scale happens at, at, at that level. So, um, uh, and I know from some great work that has been done, uh, there's a lot of innovation happening at local government, particularly where there's large ratepayer bases uh, on uh, you know, the fringes of some of the, uh, the, large, um, the large cities. And, um, and, that's, and that's a very immediate sort of uh, close um, um, connection between uh, the citizens and, uh, and, that, and that level of government. So, um, so yes, I think um, you know, there's, a, there's, a lot, there's a lot more to be said about that, but I think it's a, it's a good question. Often local government gets overlooked in these strategies. If I could add just one footnote, I would hypothesize that there's a fourth layer of government that's going to emerge, particularly with respect to data, and that's international. Um, in the medical world, for example, enormous progress has been made understanding how to improve medical treatments using so-called registries. And a registry is basically just a very large spreadsheet of data on patients' symptoms and outcomes in standardized format, which both medical researchers and clinicians use in order to find patterns that indicate that in certain circumstances, this treatment works better than that. And traditionally, the way that problem was addressed was through the double-blind clinical trial. But because of big data, we can take such enormous populations that the fact that it hasn't been set up in the highly controlled fashion of traditional medical research doesn't matter because you can see the patterns in the data through its sheer volume. The problem is that that approach scales beyond the individual nation. So Sweden, for example, which is probably in the lead worldwide in the use of registries as a basis of continuous improvement in medical practice, is beginning to merge its registries with those, for example, of other Scandinavian countries, because what they're finding is that the bigger the registry, the bigger the database, the richer are the patterns that they can see. So I think what we will see in that context, and maybe others, is the scaling particularly of data even beyond the ambit of the nation.